So let's kickstart this conference with our first speaker, Mariam. Mariam Fofana is a MD and resident in emergency medicine. She's originally from Cote d'Ivoire and has lived and worked in different countries, including Kenya, South Africa, and the US. She holds a PhD in infectious disease epidemiology and is especially interested in making global health more equitable and sustainable. Recently, she has published an insightful article on decolonizing global health in time of COVID-19. And today she will give us an introduction on the conference topic and give us an overview on the topic of decolonizing global health education. Please help me welcome Maria. All right, thank you very much, Eileen and all the conference organizers. Um, I, I will be sharing my screen here in a second so that we can get started. All right, so, uh, you know, the conference uh, theme is the future of global health. So we're all here today to imagine a different future for global health. And I've been asked specifically to talk about the role of education uh, in achieving that. I will start with uh, just a few disclosures. Uh, the first being that, you know, like everybody who's here, I am learning. Uh, we're here to have a conversation. None of what I say is gospel truth or should be taken as such. The second being that I have spent uh, the entirety of my adult and professional life in the United States, and that has obviously deeply shaped my perspectives. My objectives today are twofold. The first to uh, define and discuss coloniality in global health. And the second to imagine how we can change our existing culture, practices and structures to achieve that goal of decolonizing global health education. So I'd like to start by uh, thinking how we define these very important term, right? Global health and decolonization. And as, an, as a way to illustrate that, I'll show you on the left here is the cover of the textbook for the very first global health course that I took in college. Uh, and on the right is what the current version of this textbook looks like. So in the interim, there's been this shift from international health to global health. Uh, now, of course, when you say international health, the question is international with respect to whom? Uh, and that typically means wealthy countries, including former colonial powers and countries like the US, which are neo-colonial powers. Um, but what really has changed beyond these, you know, beyond the covers, right? How do we define global health in a way that makes it different from uh, colonial health, which is, you know, you can think of as its ancestor or its pre predecessor of international health, right? What do these definitions tell us about the core values of global health as it currently exists? And the thing is, global health is actually still a very amorphous umbrella term for a broad range of activities and disciplines. You know, people come from a variety of backgrounds or engaging in a very broad set of activities uh, that fall under this uh, umbrella term. Uh, so I'll offer to you some of the definitions that have been offered, and it illustrates a little bit the expensiveness of that term and the lack of a unified definition. So the first, uh, an area of study, research and practice that places a priority on improving health and achieving health equity for all people worldwide. I'd say the key words in this definition are health equity and all people worldwide. Another proposed definition, <clears throat> um, a public health approach that responds to the globalized world. Uh, or those health issues that transcend national boundaries and governments and call for actions on the global forces that determine the health of people. I'd say the key words here are globalized world, right? And issues that are, go beyond national boundaries. Another one here, collaborative transnational research and action for promoting health for all. As you can see, that's a very expensive definition, right? But I'd say the key word here is collaborative. Uh, how collaborative are we actually uh, in, in our current practice of global health? Uh, and this one offered by the UK government, uh, focused on people across the whole planet rather than the concerns of particular nations. So we can see that, you know, when we, the, the aspiration of global health is to be, uh, 
to achieve equity for all people worldwide to be truly collaborative across nations. Uh, unfortunately, the reality is that, you know, Global health, unfortunately, still remains largely controlled by former colonial powers and neo neocolonial powers, and it tends to replicate a lot of the same hierarchies of power of the colonial era. And it ends up looking all too often like this, uh, this parody uh, tweet uh, of Barbie Savior, right? So Savior Barbie is saying, uh, Barbie Savior, sorry. She's saying, who needs a formal education to teach in Africa? Not me. All I need is some chalk and a dose of optimism. It's so sad that they don't have enough trained teachers here. I'm not trained either, but I'm from the West, so it all works out. Uh, and you could pretty much change, you know, teach with, you know, whatever word you want for the delivery of health interventions. And that is unfortunately a lot of what we are seeing uh, in global health today. Uh, fortunately, all of you are here because you want to change that. Uh, and the movement I think is, is gaining steam, but I think it's still not quite at the core uh, or, you know, it's, it's still not the norm, unfortunately, for global health. So uh, this brings us to the idea of decolonizing global health, right? Uh, I imagine all of you here have some degree of pre-existing interest and knowledge on this topic, uh, and some of you may be more new to the idea. Uh, regardless of that, I think it's worth thinking about what we mean when we use this term, which has become very popular, um, and again, I'll illustrate with some definitions that people in the field have offered, okay? Um, so global health in its current form still functions amidst a system of hierarchies of knowledge and culture that are directly derived from colonization. So Eben Bull and Pai uh, in uh, one publication offered the definition of decolonizing as removing all forms of supremacy within all spaces of global health practice within countries, between countries, and at the global level. That's like a, that's a high challenge, right? All forms of supremacy in all spaces of global health. That's a lot to achieve. Um, another uh, uh, definition that was offered is the flattening of entrenched colonial era power hierarchies. And the key thing that the authors uh, who propose this definition do is that they really offer what the role of education is in this process, right? They say that the sources and concentration of that power must first be laid bare through educational reflection that prompts political will and collective action. OK, so when you're thinking about how can you decolonize something that would not exist without the hierarchies of power created by colonization, our first step is going to be awareness and like making explicit these structures that we had previously accepted as inherent and static to our world. Um, Doing so will require not only changing the existing culture of global health, and that's part of what we're doing here today, uh, making the idea of decolonization more than a buzzword and really a core value of global health. We also have to change our practices as teachers and learners and practitioners of global health. And the hardest part is going to be changing the structures and systems. Um, and some of us are better placed than others to do that, depending on really how much power we hold uh, within these existing structures and systems. Okay, so starting with changing culture, which is really the first step, I think the most important thing that you can do is to examine the history of global health and how it continues to be shaped by colonial hierarchies of power, right? I think it is uh, primordial that any time that you're teaching a global health course, this should be not only, it should be a core component of that course. You cannot just teach about these are the inequalities that exist now, or these are the health problems that exist now, but teach about how global health came to be, how colonial medicine was meant to support the, um, the expansion of colonial empires and their economic exploitation of the countries that they were colonizing, how as we transition to international health, it was still very much you know, high income countries, former colonial powers that were protecting their new commercial endeavors in countries that were no longer uh, juridically colonized, but still very much under, um, a, under a lot of political and economic influence of these former colonial powers. And how, yes, we've, we're trying to think more about equity now, but we're still bearing a lot of that inheritance, inheritance of uh, colonial medicine and international health. 
Um, it means that we have to recognize and question the patterns of power and privilege that continue to exist in global health to this day. And this is something that can be very hard. We have to recognize our own power and privilege, okay? We have to be able to call ourselves out. So when we look, for example, at where global health funding comes from, this is a graphic from the uh, Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, where on the left, you can see all of the various countries and organizations that provide global health funding, uh, the channels and what areas of focus this funding goes to. So high income countries and private philanthropies, which can be very problematic, right? You know. Um, they are the primary funders of global health activities and they get to set the agenda. And when we're thinking about private philanthropies of people in the high income world, these are people who are not accountable necessarily to any government, right? They get to choose their pet topic, their pet issue of what they're going to fund. And the priorities of the people who are on the receiving end of all this don't necessarily play into setting that agenda. So that's very problematic. Uh, we see the same patterns uh, when we think about people who are leaders in what are considered global health organizations. So this is uh, pulled from a report by this organization called Global Health 5050 that works on equity in global health. Um, and it, uh, it kind of describes the distribution of people who are leaders in global health organizations. And you can see uh, from the, if you look at the, the top row as people is low and middle income countries, the bottom row is high income countries. And the vast majority of people who are leaders in global health organizations come from high income countries. And even more shockingly, right, a full half of them are from just two countries, one being the UK, which is what was one of the most extensive colonial empires, right? If you've heard the expression that the sun never sets on the British Empire, the other being the US, which is, you know, a settler colonial state and is essentially the new face of empire in the era of global neoliberalism. Um, and then there's this quite startling statistic that you can see in the last uh, graphic at the bottom right, that a full 8%, that's nearly a 10th of these people in positions of power and leadership in global health organizations, got their degrees from one single university. So there's a huge concentration of power uh, within these uh, high income countries and within certain institutions in these countries, right? So when we think about where funding comes from, where decisions are made, who gets credentials, who gets credit, we're seeing the same pattern as we saw in colonial medicine, those same hierarchies. The vast majority of degrees specializing in global health are offered by institutions in North America and Europe, right? So this means that institutions in these places have a huge power to shape who gets into the global health workforce and which perspectives and backgrounds will be represented and valued. OK, it also means that they have a huge opportunity to change the way that we teach and practice global health. And for anybody who is within those institutions, especially people who are in a position of uh, power and leadership um, in those institutions, you can really uh, significantly change the, sh the shape and the face of global health education. So as we, as I said before, we have to examine the history of global health, recognize uh, patterns of power and privilege when we teach global health. I think we also have to teach global health in a way that is critical of global health institutions and endeavors, right? That means taking a hard look in the mirror. It means listening to marginalized voices uh, and understanding that even with good intentions, uh, we can be uh, and often are complicit in perpetuating power inequities. Right? So we have to teach not just the what or where of global health problems, but how these problems arose and how they are perpetuated. Uh, so an example of that is, you know, this article that describes how Oxford University had uh, helped develop a COVID vaccine and had initially pledged to donate the rights to it. Uh, and then at the urging of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is of course a major uh, organization in global health, they ended up signing an exclusive deal with AstraZeneca, uh, who uh, is now producing the vaccine for, for profit, right? With no guarantee of low prices. And as we know, this is now becoming a huge issue in terms of vaccine access in low and middle income countries. There's the uh, you know added layer of um, 
issues of uh, intellectual property rights and waiving those so that those countries can produce their own vaccines. So we can see how uh, in, uh, organizations that are purportedly committed to global health are actually complicit in perpetuating these structures of power, right? Why don't we uh, give low middle, middle income countries the capacity to produce their own vaccines instead of you know, having them pay for these vaccines produced by industry and then giving donor funds to, uh, to go to that. There's this, you know, this perpetuation of dependence on donor funds when we uh, 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 do things in the way that uh, Oxford and the Gates Foundation did. Uh, and then finally, I think we have to really emphasize equity as a guiding principle when we teach global health, right? We have to steer away from the currently predominant mindset that global health is something that we do out of charity or to uh, acquire political goodwill or soft power, because charity is how you end up with the Gates Foundation, you know, making Oxford uh, uh, sell their vaccine to AstraZeneca and then probably giving money to countries to purchase that vaccine. And then they get to be the good guy because they donated money for, you know, countries to buy vaccines when actually they got in the way of countries producing their own vaccines or making agreements uh, to get these vaccines in a much more direct and um, uh, way from the, um, from the people who developed them. So for those of us who belong to institutions in high income countries, we really also have a responsibility to change how we practice global health, okay? So in addition to uh, changing what we teach in global health, we need to change the who, the where, and the how of teaching global health. And I think in that respect, the COVID-19 pandemic has actually been profoundly instructive. Now, as we know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has really widened certain disparities, worsened them, but it's also offered a path to more inclusion and equity in education. So we've become uh, reliant on distance education, kind of in the, in the way that we are doing now. And that has really opened the door to greater inclusion of people from across the world, right? If you're teaching a global health course in, in Canada, and usually all of your guest speakers were uh, colleagues at your own institution, now you can have somebody from a low middle class in middle income country, zoom in to give a guest lecture, right? And you can have students from all over the world also participate. So both uh, on the teaching side and on the learning side, you can have people from uh, greater equity in who is participating uh, and from where. Um, and perhaps you don't even, you know, if you're in a high income institution in, uh, in Europe or North America, you don't get to be the instructor of record of the course anymore. Somebody else can be the instructor of record remotely. Um, you know, there's, you can engage a lot in public scholarship and that can take many forms, whether it's webinars similar to what we're doing now, uh, making YouTube videos uh, or tutorials uh, or using the, you know, Reddit AMA forums uh, to make your scholarship and your teaching more accessible to people all over the world. And you can do it in synchronous ways like we're doing now or in asynchronous ways uh, like YouTube videos, for example, that people can log in in whatever time zone they're in and uh, learn and, and uh, engage in, in discussion. Um, Conferences uh, have been a huge barrier to, um, have had huge barriers to participation for people from low and middle income countries. One, because they're super expensive, you know, and in addition, because they're primarily occurring in high income countries, people from low and middle income countries have to pay for the cost of travel to go there, uh, which are disproportionately high to their incomes. Uh, and even if they have all of the things together, you know, depending on what color your passport is, you may not even get to travel where you want to travel in order to, you know, determine your work and share with your colleagues. So online conferences have also, online or hybrid formats, have lowered the barrier to participation for people from low and middle income countries. Uh, and we can kind of take what we've uh, uh, learned from edu the education field to extend that to other areas, right? We're adapting to remote work now. We're unlinking positions from the geographical location, right? So we can even think about having leadership in organizations not necessarily be uh, geographically linked to where the institution is. We can have people uh, be, you know, teaching courses or be uh, deans or course directors from anywhere in the world. And then the hardest part is really the, the structural change, right? That's where we really have to put our, our money where our mouth is and quite literally, right? We have to be willing to shift money and other resources away from the current centers of power. Uh, for example, this can mean investing in scholarships for low and middle income country learners. Um, 
engaging in student exchanges that are truly bilateral instead of the current pattern of students in high income countries having learning experiences in low and middle income countries. Um, it also means, you know, questioning whether you should have uh, your student from your high income country institution travel halfway across the globe to work on a project, maybe you should instead hire local students so that you can promote local uh, workforce and local leadership, right? And of course, what that's going to mean is that your student in the, at your uh, HIC institution is going to lose out on that opportunity. We're going to lose out on some of the opportunities and privileges that we currently hold in the high income world, okay? Uh, and we have to commit to that. And we have to commit to not just returning to the pre-COVID normal, right? We, if we go back to in-person conferences exclusively, if we go back to teaching everything uh, in person, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have lost some of what we've gained uh, during this time. We have to commit to continuing to including people from all over the world by using uh, these adaptations to our teaching practices. Um, and you can even go a little bit further, right? We have to think about, you know, do we invest in funding people from low and middle income countries to participate in conferences, for example? Uh, so I'll leave you with a couple of, of thoughts here. These are, this is from a paper by uh, Leo, uh, Leoba Hirsch in uh, The Lancet. She's asking, you know, is it actually possible to decolonize global health institutions? And what she emphasizes uh, first is that uh, there has to be a relinquishing of power. Okay, um, so she says it means cutting this cutting these people off who have benefited from the system and use their privilege to discriminate against others or let an oppressive system go unchallenged. It also means recognizing that some people um, in the global health community have tried to change the system from within for a very long time without recognition. There is a risk that they are pushed aside now by flashy consultants and everybody, everyone's scramble to prove their decolonial credentials. So as you know, the idea of decolonizing gets more and more popular, we have to make sure that it's not, we're not just having people who are, you know, flashing it as a buzzword and displacing the people who have actually been trying to do this work uh, uh, from the inside for years and decades. And then very importantly, she says, decolonizing will require a radical redistribution of funding away from high income countries, a loss of epistemic and political authority, and a limitation to our power to intervene in low income and middle income countries. We have to be willing to lose power and privilege. Okay. So, um, you know, if we truly commit to dismantling these inequitable structures and hierarchies, I, eventually my, my, my vision is that there will no longer be a need for global health as it currently exists, right? It will no longer have meaning or at least not the same meaning. Uh, and that to me was really illustrated well by this quote um, from uh, uh, Subcomandante Marcos of the uh, Zapatista rebel army who said essentially that the 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 army should have it as its highest goal to disappear and i think similarly you know the ultimate goal of global health should be its own obsolescence should be that it is no longer needed at least as it currently exists uh and perhaps one day our textbooks will not say international public health or global health but just public health so uh, with that, I'd like to thank you everyone. Uh, thank everyone for listening. I've included a, a link here to some of the references that I've used in this presentation, as well as some additional reading and resources. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing our other speakers.